Happy Sunday. So great to see everyone. If you'd like to stand with us, we're going to go into a time of worship together. Joyful, joyful Lord, we adore thee. God of glory, Lord of love, hearts unfold like flowers before thee, opening to the sun above, melt the clouds of all our sadness, drive the dark of doubt away, giver of immortal gladness. Fill us with the light of day. All thy works with joy surround thee. Earth and heaven reflect thy rays. Stars and angels sing around thee. Center of unbroken praise. Field and forest, vale and mountain, flowery meadow, flashing sea. Chanting bird and flowing fountain, call us to rejoice in thee. Thou art giving and forgiving, ever blessing, ever blessed. Wellspring of the joy of living. Ocean depth of happy rest, loving mother, Christ our brother, let your light upon us shine. Teach us how to love each other, lift us to the joy divine. join the mighty chorus which the morning stars begin God's own love is reigning o'er us joining people hand in hand ever singing march we onward victors in the midst of strife Joyful music leads us sunward in the triumph sound of life. 
joyful music leads us sunward in the triumph song of life. God, today I am just feeling grateful for this community, uh, grateful for the beauty of the snow this past week, uh, grateful for music and how it can um, make words hit us in a different way than they might otherwise. And uh, I pray that this time can just be a sweet reflection on our week and a sweet time with you. I've searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. Then you came along, and we carry it together. You give me strength to find a new way here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws. Lord, you've seen them all and you still call me friend. Because the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. And there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Better than you, Lord, there's nothing, nothing is better than you. You turn graves into gardens, you give beauty for ashes. You turn mourning to dancing, you're the only one who can. You turn graves into gardens, you give beauty for ashes. You turn mourning to dancing, you're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Better than you, Lord, there's nothing, nothing is better than you. You turn graves into gardens, you give beauty for ashes, you turn mourning to dancing, you're the only one who you turn graves into gardens. You give beauty 
for ashes. You turn mourning to dancing. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. You're the only. This next song is a song we've done a few times here um, in this community, and uh, but it's a newer song in general, and I really resonate with um, sometimes referring to God as the name of Sophia, which is just a feminine version of the name God, and uh, it means wisdom, and um, a lot of times throughout history and scripture, um, this word kind of shows up, this name of wisdom for God, and this feminine name, Sophia, so that's what that means when that comes up in here. Thank you for your love and your goodness, and thank you that it is within us and all around us always. In Jesus' name, amen. Feel free to take a seat, and our friend Kelsey is going to lead us through a little communal prayer. All right, I'm Kelsey. Um, Sometimes we practice communal prayer here, so there's going to be some prompts on the slide. Um, Feel free, if you would like, to read out loud when um, it says all, um, and we'll... uh, enter this prayer together. We are made in the likeness of eternal creativity. Its insistence moves us into being and imagines for us worlds beyond our hopelessness. 
We are made to collaborate with those around us to build deeper connections and sustainability around new ways of doing life together. We are making space in our world for doubt and uncertainty by calling out fear and isolationism. This is the truth about us. It always has been and always will be. Thank you, Kelsey. Uh, my name is Greta. Hello, if I haven't met you, I'm one of the pastors here at the Commons, and I am going to share a couple announcements with you. Uh, so, you may have noticed the big trailer in the parking lot as you were coming in, and today is our first Sunday of our Savers fundraiser. So, we're partnering with the thrift store in town, Savers, and we are collecting used goods. So, your old clothes and house stuff that you don't want anymore. Um, and for today, as well as next Sunday, uh, we're going to have that trailer out there, and you can throw all your stuff you want to get rid of in there, and we will take it to Savers for you, and then they will donate money to us on behalf of that stuff. So that's a, just a super easy way to help us fundraise. And um, if you're interested in cleaning out some closets, please do that. And we would love that. Um, but if you forgot today, have no fear. You can bring it next week um, or coordinate with us throughout the week if you need another drop-off time. Also, today is a special Sunday because Right after service today, we are doing our biannual uh, financial update. So if you have any questions about how the commons receives money or spends money or how we budget things and how we're currently doing on all of those issues, we'd love for you to come join us. We're going to have pizza. If you have kids that you're worried might be a little squirmy during that meeting, um, we're going to throw a kids movie on in the youth room. And we're just going to share everything with you. We're an open book. So if you want to see um, all of the things and how much Charlie makes and all of the things and <laughs> We will share all of that with you because it's not too crazy of anything to brag about. But um, So come hang with us if you would like. It's going to be a sweet time um, just to catch up. And we always kind of think of it as like a family dinner. Like if you are a part of a family and um, you sit down as your family together and you say, okay, this is where we're at. This is where we're struggling. What are we going to do together as a family to um, plan our way forward? That's what this is. It's a family dinner where we can connect and dream about those things together. Also, on February 12th, it's the Super Bowl, so we're canceling church because I think there would only be about three of you here. Um, so we're going to have a couple of Super Bowl party options. Uh, one is going to be at Blaine's house, and one is going to be at Chad and Holland's house. So the addresses are up there. We'll also put those on our website and on our social media. But that'll just be a potluck party and start at 4 p.m. So everyone's welcome, and just don't show up here on Super Bowl Sunday. Also, like we've been talking about our mission trip to Mexico to build a house with the organization called One Mission is coming up over President's Day weekend uh, starting February 17th. So if you're interested in that, please come talk to us. We'd love for you to come. Sign-up sheets are on the info table, um, and we're going to be having a team meeting here coming up soon. So make sure you talk to us. Get your $100 deposit in, and make sure you have a functioning passport. All those things. It's coming up and going to be a really amazing trip over that long weekend. All right. And my last thing to share with you is um, we have an exciting thing coming up on February 26th. We're doing a foster care, respite care, adoption Q&A time. So we're really passionate here about the needs of the um, foster care system in Arizona. And there's a huge need. There's no open beds. Everything is taken. So when a kid gets um, put into foster care or removed out of an emergency situation, many times, most times, um, they might not have a place to go. And they're reaching out to emergency kind of contacts and maybe having to locate them in different cities. Um, and we think as a church, this is something we should be talking about. So. Um, Join us if you just have questions, even if you're not interested, even if you just want to know how you can support families, even if that topic scares you, but you just need to show up to a meeting and put yourself in an uncomfortable situation to learn more. 
we challenge you to come. Um, it's going to be on, yeah, February 26th, right after service. We'll have soup and bread provided um, and a sweet time to hang and just ask questions and learn about that together. And I'm going to invite our friends Nick and Caleb up. And these friends have just started a new community group this last year, and they want to tell you about it. So let's give them a hand. Thank you. I'm Nick. I'm Caleb. Oh, I'm starting. Um, hi, so yeah, so we started a Bible study. The group is called the FOSO group. It's kind of like, FOSO is kind of like FOMO, but instead of the fear of missing out, it's the fear of squandering opportunity. Um, so one of the reasons we started this group is me and Nick were feeling and noticing that like a lot of our friends were feeling like we were waiting for something to happen in our lives, like waiting for a job or waiting for uh, like to meet somebody to get married or anything like that. Um, but we wanted to kind of push against that, and instead of waiting for stuff to happen, we're trying to take advantage of the opportunities God has given us right now in our life. Um, so that's kind of um, one of the main things the group is about. The other two main things, um, first we wanted to just build a uh, community, build friendships with other people that are trying to pursue God and um, figure out what it looks like to follow God in our lives right here in Flagstaff. And then the third thing we're hoping is that um, after we build that community and those friendships in the group, that that will kind of overflow and we could love our community and our city well um, through, through service and volunteering and that sort of thing. Sweet. Yeah, and this has been going on since November now. And so we've had a night of, commun we did a communion night. We've done one about talking about resurrecting church. Um, we've done one about Job um, and a say more night. And so um, with that, we meet at the Commons office at 7 p.m. Mondays, and we're talking about sacrificial love tomorrow. So if you're interested, we're going to hang out afterwards a little bit, and you can come say what's up. Cool. Thank you. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Greta. Welcome, everyone. We certainly hope that you feel very, very welcome today at the Commons, especially if you're visiting with us. Uh, we, our motto has always been church for everyone, and we believe that to be really centrally true. Um, I, we also like to, at this time of our service, pray for another church in town. It's sort of a practice to connect us to the oneness of the body of Christ and all of its diversity, and we love doing that. So today, we're going to pray for Flagstaff Family Church. I actually don't know much about them or their pastors, but I see their sign over there off Steve's and 66. So I thought, let's pray for those guys, because um, we love them, even out without knowing them. So if you're the praying type, join me, and we're going to pray for Flagstaff Family Church. Yeah, thanks so much uh, for this community. Thank you so much for... Um, the hope we have that we get to be a part of an ancient tradition and uh, a movement, a way of being that has spread around the globe in every country and language. And God, in this town, thank you for this, the diversity of churches. And we pray for Flagstaff Family Church. Let them know they are loved by you and by all. And uh, let us all just draw closer to you. And we pray today as we begin a new discussion on the book of Revelation, would you open up our hearts and minds in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, um, who is slightly sore from snow shoveling this week? See a few hands around, kind of crooked hands, lower back pain. Yeah, that was an epic storm. I'm feeling like at our house we're approaching but not quite achieving the 2009 famous 54 inches, but we're, we're getting there out at our house, and it's been a lot, a lot of snow shoveling. Even getting here at church today and doing some more snow shoveling was a great joy, really, really fun. Yesterday, I got up, though, and I drove the kids, well, our family, we drove down at 4 o'clock in the morning. We got up. It was like negative 3 degrees, and we, Sierra had a volleyball tournament, and because youth sports is a psychotic world of twisted people, they had a tournament that started at 8 a.m., and they had to be there at 7 a.m., so we got up at 4 and left when it was negative 3, and everything was frozen and broken and hurting, and I was driving, and it was dark, and I was tired, but as I was going, thankfully, uh, the kids fell asleep, and I, as I was driving along, I cranked a little bit of a Spotify playlist that actually my son Colt made years ago when we drove together to Wyoming, and it's called Colt's 90s Playlist. And for whatever reason, I'm sure you've had this experience if you're a human being driving at some point in your life, it was the right playlist. Have you ever had that experience? 
There might be another day where that's not the right playlist, but when I was tired and it was dark and cold and I just wanted everyone to live as we got kind of off the rim and down into safer roads, the 90s music was filling my soul. In a way, art saved my life and probably saved my family's life. Isn't that cool? Here's the thing about art, though. It's a little bit tricky. It's a, it's a tricky little mistress art because music could, in theory, also kill you. My oldest daughter uh, was in a horrible car accident because she was riding with her friends when she was probably 13 years old and a high school girl was driving them from a soccer practice out in Doney Park and they all started singing, I think it was a Frozen song that was playing on the radio and they were singing so loud and having so much fun, the high school girl just ran right through the stop sign and got T-boned at like 55 miles an hour in this 12 passenger van. Thank God nobody died. It was a horrible accident, huge totaled cars. I think the, the driver of the other car was very injured, but okay. And music almost killed my daughter. Music can save you and music can kill you, right? I can think of it in a more real way. There could be an artful song that's written about someone maybe opening up about the struggle of self-harm or suicide. And somebody might hear that song and it might make them realize they're not alone in that struggle. And that art might actually be a gateway or, or a bridge that brings them to life and healing. Someone else might hear that same song and get an idea in their head they didn't have in their head before that they can't get out of their head and be part of this vicious cycle. My point is art, is powerful and it can be used for good or bad. It's like a lot of things, the internet is like that. It's a force multiplier, money is like that. It can be used for good or bad. And what we're gonna do today is revisit, as some of you know, I announced this last week when we canceled church on our little Instagram video. We're gonna revisit a five-year-old sermon where we're gonna open up one of the most dangerous, beautiful, poetic, life transformative texts that any human being has ever put to paper that's probably had a bigger impact on scaring people and healing people and liberating people and changing lives and even harming people ever. The famous book of Revelation. Who's excited to dive into this one? I think we posted on social media and there was a couple comments like, oof, good luck. You know, it's kind of one of those kind of vibes. It's a tricky book. It is the book of Revelation, so don't be that person who says revelations, plural, because that's just really embarrassing. It's a singular Revelation. So you have already got your money's worth today. You don't ever want to make that mistake walking around talking about the book, the book of Revelation. I love this book now. I have hated this book at times in my life. When I was 17 years old, I had the harebrained idea to sit down and read the entire book of Revelation because I was that kind of kid. And I read the whole thing and I was kind of confused as to how I felt. I grew up in a version of Christianity in this country where Revelation was adored in its prophetic future-telling sense, in its capacity and power to cause people to maybe convert to Christianity, to avoid some of the prophecies that are contained in this horrible, terrible, beautiful book. And so when I read it as a 17-year-old, there was a lot of feelings inside of me. There was feelings of excitement and fear. I actually brought this book up here because <clears throat> some of you are familiar with N.T. Wright, and uh, he's probably one of the greatest theologians alive. He was an Anglican bishop, and actually he was a professor of mine when I studied in Scotland. And this book had a quote from him from, he did the same thing. He read through Revelation when he was a teenager, and this is what he said. The funny thing is, I'm quite sure I didn't understand what on earth what it was about, but I can still remember the explosive power and beauty of it. The sense that the New Testament I held in my hands had a thunderstorm hidden inside it that nobody had warned me about. He, he just says stuff better than I can. That's kind of how I felt. I was kind of like, I don't understand this, but there's something artful or scary or big about it, and people talk about it. And then, of course, when I was in college, the Left Behind series came out. And maybe if you're older than me, you might remember Hal Lindsey's series, The Late Great Planet Earth. There's this genre of literature in American evangelicalism that creates a fictional account of what might happen if you take revelation in a literal, what we would call eschatological sense or dispensational, which those are super fun words that there will be no quiz on later. It's a very unique modern way of viewing this book that says that part of what this book is about is all of these things are literal truths that will happen and part of the story is Christians who believe the right things will be raptured into the sky and meet Jesus in the air and ultimately Jesus will come down and a sword will come out of his mouth and he will slaughter everyone who doesn't believe and a river of blood feet high will cover the earth. You know, Jesus of Nazareth stuff, right? The radical rabbi, the prince of peace, the turn your other cheek guy. 
Here's what I want to do. I want to talk about what sort of thing Revelation is today because I think it's actually incredibly powerful and beautiful and it's so dangerous. I don't think any book of the Bible has been more misused or abused or caused more harm than the book of Revelation, whereas what is actually contained in it is one of the most artful representations of a hope of nonviolence and a lamb who was slain conquering over an empire and a completely beautiful picture about an inclusive, beloved community where everyone's welcome to the tree of life. Some of the best art around. Here's the problem. It's not a kid's book. It's got whores in it. It's got beasts and ten-headed dragons. It's violent and sexual and prophetic and apocalyptic. And one of the things that's so hard about Revelation is it requires a lot of knowledge about what sort of book it is before we can even begin to appreciate the art. I'm not a huge art connoisseur, but five years ago when we went through this series, I used the example of the, the painting Guernica by Picasso. I have a picture of, uh, this is in the museum in Madrid where Picasso has a museum there. And I actually went there. Actually, I think when I did this series five years ago, I hadn't seen this painting in real life, but I was there speaking at a thing in Barcelona and I had this rental car and I actually snuck into this museum because they were closed and they were like, don't take pictures, but I took this picture because I just want you guys to know I'm like a rebel, right? Like, who takes pictures in a museum? It's crazy. I took this picture. And look at that guy. It's a huge painting. But it's a very, very powerful painting. And I'm sure some of you have had experience with art before. When you see it, it somehow captures you. For whatever reason, the darkness and the weirdness of this painting, I'm not really a huge Picasso fan, but something stood out to me. But here's the thing. If you just look at that painting and you just try to understand it or interpret it, you might think, well, I guess the truth of this painting is... There's bull heads with weird eyes and a glowing light in the world, and some people drag their legs and have giant calves. If you tried to take this painting literally, if that's the interpretive method you used, I don't think you're going to get much out of this painting. I sure don't. I mean, maybe you might get something out of it. But if you knew the context of this painting, that Guernica is a town in Spain, and that Picasso, as a famous artist in the time, right before World War II, experienced the horrific bombing of this town, Guernica. It's a little tiny country town that the Nazi allies of the Italian fascist bombed horrifically and killed everyone in an absolutely horrific show of power in the Spanish Civil War right before Nazi Germany rose to fullest power. He went and used his art to tell truth about the horrors of war. Newspaper articles covered it. There was photos, in fact, there's a, I have an old black and white photo of the destruction of Guernica. This is the, the aftermath of the town after the Nazis and the fascists bombed it. But the accounts of the human suffering, the horses, the women that were killed were so graphic that Picasso turned to his art to try to produce a truth about the horrors of war. Now, Trey, can you show the, the full picture of the painting just across the thing? To me, if I know a little bit about what the artist is going for, the sort of truth that comes from the art becomes more accessible to me. I can go, war is horrible. And there's something sort of captivating in the way that this modernistic artist tried to express the anger and the rage for the oppressed people who were bombed by an evil empire. He used art to do that. What do you think this has to do with Revelation? That's what Revelation is. It's incredible art. It's imagery about a real place in real time that is a critique of violence and a critique of unchecked capitalism and a critique of nationalism, and it's an uplifting of the divinity and humanity of Christ. It's a book about Jesus Christ of Nazareth and his, Nazareth and his nonviolent, incredible, almost comedic overcoming of the greatest empire that ever existed on earth with his nonviolent, simple way of being that calls us not just to love our neighbors, but to love our enemies. Is that what you've heard of when you heard of the book of Revelation? Because when I heard of the book of Revelation, I heard of things like 666 and the Antichrist and the rapture. Anybody heard any of those things in the, in the book of Revelation? How many of you think those are in the book of Revelation? Don't raise your hand. None of those things are in the book of Revelation. The word Antichrist not mentioned in the book of Revelation. That word is only used once in the whole Bible, and it's in Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, and it's about people who are anti the message of Christ. The rapture, not in Revelation. 
I promise, go read it cover to cover. You won't find it. It's not in there. It's in Left Behind. It's in the late great planet Earth. It's in modern dispensational American theology, but it's not in the book of Revelation. 666, not in there. The original text is 616, and it's actually Roman numerals that spell out the name of Nero, who was a Roman emperor who was hanging up Christians and burning them on the side of the road. But what's happened is we have inhabited a culture who's taken a book that is an artful critique of violence, a hopeful prophecy of what sort of world we could live in, a book that has a kind of truth that could actually make our own community today more flourishing, our earth more healthy and vibrant, could actually connect us to each other. And what we've done is turned it into some sort of literalistic shame tactic fear tool to try to scare people into converting to our religion before the violent God comes and gets them all. And so I have really, really good news if that's the only version you've ever heard of Revelation. That's not it. That's very, very modern understanding. In fact, the whole story that we inherited in this country was not talked about by any Christians at all for the first 1,800 years of Christianity. In fact, where I went to school in Scotland, not far down the road is a little place called Glasgow, and there was a 15-year-old girl who was caught up in a, in a sort of illness and a fever pitch, and she was a Christian who was very into prophecy. And she had this vision that there would be two second comings of Christ, that Christ would come back literally and physically to this earth once and rapture his people up into the sky and a second time for the fullment of things, and that's what Revelation was about. And there was a guy named John Nelson Darby who was visiting Glasgow, and he went and visited her, was so compelled by her vision that he came back to the United States and he began to teach people, especially people like Nelson and other Bible interpreters, that the book of Revelation is about a rapture and escaping away from God's wrath on this doomed earth. No Christians believed any of that for over 1,800 years. It's the first time any Christian believed that. And yet the power of that idea that got into the seminaries in just this country, the United States of America, and the missionaries that come from this country and from Scotland, in translations of Bibles, all of a sudden created a whole new story that does this terrible thing, and this is what I want you to hear. It not only strips away the Christ-centered, God-infused, loving, non-violent, transformative message that Revelation actually contains, it's so much worse than that. It actually creates in its place a harmful, shame-filled theology that scares people away from real Christianity and does so much more than that. It also creates an terrible view of the Middle East. Did you know that we have elected politicians? Like some people in the world will think this is crazy. You, you will all just go, oh yeah, of course I know that. There are elected politicians in this country who shape their policies on the country of modern day Israel because they believe truly Politicians in our country, in our government elected, they believe that if we unquestionably support Israel in every single way, it will help usher in Jesus Christ landing his feet in Jerusalem and bringing on the end times. And in so doing, have passed some of the most horrific, slave-infused legislation that you could possibly imagine in countries' affairs that are none of our own because of a terrible reading of this book. Why am I saying all this? I just want you to know the stakes are really high. If you get the idea of what revelation is wrong and you believe that this is what God is saying, then you're actually not only missing the truth and the love and the connection that's in it, you actually become part of harmful systems. Did you also know that because of a bad interpretation of this book, many Christians don't believe we should care at all about climate change or just earth or creation care because they think what this book says is God is gonna burn this all down and we're gonna escape off to soulish heaven when he raptures Christians away. That's not what this book says. This entire book, this library of text, God's word, tells us from beginning to end that this creation is good. It is very good. It is our home. And one of the most radical ideas of Christianity is that God infuses this creation. God's not leaving it, neither are we. The new heaven and the new earth is to come through God and us and our actions. And this book is an empowering, inspiring piece of art that can move us to love each other, love ourselves, love our planet, and draw closer to the universal Christ the lamb who was slain in nonviolence. And we can even bring down dragons and empires. 
Okay, we're going to read a little bit of Revelation, even though this is just sort of a trailer today. We're not totally getting into it because I don't want to spoil all the good stuff. We'll just read the opening passage here to get us going. This is Revelation 1, verse 1. The revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John, who testifies to everything he saw. That is, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart what is written in it, because the time is near." So the intro to this book is very instructive. In the ancient world, part of my nerdy life was textual criticism and interpreting all sorts of ancient texts, Plutarch's lives and translating Homer's Iliad and looking at Jewish religious texts and Christian religious texts. And one of the most important things when you're trying to figure out what sort of text you're reading is the opening paragraph and section. And this one starts out by saying the revelation of Jesus Christ and going on to explain how that happened. The word revelation is apocalypso in Greek, which probably sounds very familiar to your ears. The Greek word apocalypso just means revelation or epiphany or breaking of the dawn or turning the lights on because that's what a revelation is in your life, right? If you have a revelation, the light bulb comes on. That's literally the name of this book. The light bulb comes on. See the light. Learn something new. Unfortunately, it's really hard for us because of apocalypse now and the way this English word apocalypse has taken on this end times meaning, end of the world sort of idea that's bound by literal time spaces that we sometimes forget that the book Revelation just simply means turn the light on, reveal what is true. And this revelation is from Jesus of Nazareth. And there's a messenger involved who's John. And we don't know a lot about the author of Revelation. The early church associated this John with being the disciple John. And I'll just tell you right now, secular scholars, liberal scholars, Christian, conservative scholars across the spectrum, nobody knows for sure if this John was the disciple John. We know this was late in the first century. We know where it was written. It was written on this island called Patmos, right across from Ephesus, which is modern-day Turkey. And if this is boring to you, I want you to lean in for just a second. This book has a home. This is really important. If you only think of it as this mystical, spiritual truth, it's going to tell you how to escape some sort of plagues and demons and escape into some sort of soulish heaven. You'll forget that this book had a home and an author and a setting. And it was what is now modern-day Turkey. This was 2,000 years ago. It was the end of the first century. The Roman Empire had expanded across multiple continents and had tens of millions of people in it. And one particular section of it, which is now modern-day Turkey, had a a counter-movement called Christianity that was growing, and it was led by women and orphans as they spread this message of good news and inclusion. And as it spread virally around the Mediterranean, there were seven different little house churches in what is modern-day Turkey And John lived and traveled among them, and he went off to this island to get away to hear from God, and he wrote down one of the most artful, beautiful things that's ever been penned to his community of Turkish people who are being massively oppressed by Rome and Caesar's might. There was a message in the world back then that might is right. There was a a cultural truth or meme, if you will. There was this understanding that if you have power or money, then you are doing the right thing. And Caesar understood that. Augustus, Julius, pass all the way down to Constantine, there was this drug, this addiction to a worldview that winning, it makes all the means okay. Violence is the only way to have power. Whoever carries the biggest stick has the best foreign policy. And this was the beginning of the modern world I'm sure you can resonate with still exists. But like any empire, in all of human anthropology as we've progressed, the boot of empire is on somebody's neck. Somebody is the labor force. Something is the slavery. Something in the empire is the resource. It might be sugar when in, the, in the new Indies in the new world. It might have been iron at one point. It's oil today. There's all these different resources that come to bear. And when this narrative and this image of a world where might and power and resources and control is the only way humans can exist, Have you ever heard that there are humans out there who say, it doesn't have to be this way? It happened in the American Civil War. 
Abolitionists said, it doesn't have to be this way. Slaves said, it doesn't have to be this way. Now, how did they do that? They were prophets. And they spoke prophecy because prophecy is a form of truth that's often in the form of art, and it speaks truth to power. The Jewish people had a long tradition of writing prophecy. It goes back to Jeremiah and Zephaniah and Zechariah and Isaiah and Amos and Micah and John, who wrote this book, was a huge fan of the prophets. He saw himself as a prophet. And not only did he know the Jewish prophets that we're familiar with, but he was also familiar with the apocryphal literature, Baruch and Second Esdras and Bel the Dragon. The Jewish people, even after the closed Old Testament or Jewish scriptures, continued to write apocalyptic literature. And that's what I want you to hear, just for our intro today, is that this book is so unique because you won't find another like it. Paul, you read a thing and go, what is this? And you go, oh, that's a letter to a church. You read Mark, you go, oh, that's a gospel. That's a, that's a Greco-Roman biopic about the life of Jesus. You read Daniel, you go, oh, that's prophecy. But in Revelation, we have this three things joined together. One is a letter to churches. And you're going to see next week when we dive into the beginning that just like Paul's letter, in the tradition of the early Christian church, this book was meant to be circulated around these communities and read out loud. In fact, probably performed. Most scholars believe that when John wrote this, he would have taken it back across and passed it to these seven churches, and the best readers would get up and almost act out this violent imagery, this peaceful imagery, all that it was, and the listeners would hear this prophecy, and they would hear it about the world that they lived in. They would understand when they heard about a beast that they were talking about Roman's war machine and its military might. They would understand the image of the whore and the marketing press of Rome who said that Pax Romama, the way of peace, comes through war. They understood this art because it was their language. If I wrote a letter to you, the Church of the Commons, and I, and I told you about this great elephant that came in a great war with a donkey over here, most of you would piece together that I'm talking about politics. I'm talking about Republicans and Democrats because we have imagery for that, don't we? So think of Revelation as a political cartoon and a circular letter and artful truth. Here's what I want to end with today because we're not really getting into it. This is kind of the, the so what for today. I hope more than anything to convince you uh, to enter into this conversation, and I think if I'm right, we all come to the book of Revelation in very different places. If you're like me, there's a little bit of trauma around it. I used to go to a, a church in Amarillo, Texas, that every year they had this thing called Zion. And for four days, they would have prophets come in, and they would, they would quote from the book of Revelation, and they would talk about who the Antichrist was at that time and when the end time was going to come. And year after year, they predicted this was going to be the year. And I was young enough and detached enough from that community that I would always look around and be like, were any of you guys here last January? Because <laughs> like, I've been coming for several years, and there's not been one yet that they haven't predicted it. And that is writ small, what has been writ large throughout American history. Since this new idea of taking Revelation as literal future telling has come in vogue, many groups have come saying, this is the day. May 12th, 1994 is the day that Jesus is coming back. So for me, when I hear Revelation, there's a part of me that's a little bit like, eh, hold on. Some of you may be like that. And if, if you had experiences like me, or you've been shamed, or maybe even felt fear because someone has read this book to try to scare you into joining their group or their religion or something like that, I understand that this can be a difficult thing. But I want to give you hope that you were given the wrong book. You were given the right book, but it was interpreted wrong, as all art can be. It can be harmful. It can cause shame. It can cause bad politics. It can even support oppression and lift up powerful things that actually the book itself is critiquing. I want to give you hope to lean into this conversation because I also believe that not only is it from 30,000 feet a beautiful political cartoon and call to action about speaking truth against the power that continues to oppress people today, to free up children who aren't free, to take care of this creation like we're called to take care of, to live in a blessed community that includes everyone. It is the invitation to be a part of that. It actually might be the most complex and most beautiful book of the Bible. And here's the last thing I love about it. It's Jesus. I'm very drawn to the Christian story. It's my home. It's my narrative. 
Jesus of Nazareth as the image of the divine and the human, the perfect human, the perfect divine. Nowhere is it more beautiful than the book of Revelation. This prophet in the late first century, he didn't hold back. He pulled out every literary resource from all of his library of knowledge. He pulled out all of his spiritual energy and all of his language to point us to the fact that Jesus of Nazareth is the true ruler of the world. That the political stuff, the power, the oppression that we must stand under his name all comes together under the, the sword coming out of Christ's mouth, which is not a sword of death. It's the sword of his words of loving enemy. See, the sword comes out at the end of Revelation, not to kill, but to heal, as Jesus always did, and to bring about a reality of a community where everyone is welcome to touch the light of God and the love of God and to be included. It's a real, real good book. That's your teaser trailer. We should have just done a little three-minute video. It'd be easier. But I want to encourage you to come back and hang with us, invite somebody if you want to have a conversation. And the commons, we have always been very careful, I've always been really careful, to use the language of discussions or conversations. I actually think I stole this from Kyle like early on, like 12 years ago. Instead of saying like, we're doing a sermon series, it's more like a discussion. And I don't think that's ever more true than something that's a little bit complicated like Revelation. I want to invite you to start having a conversation about this, because I think it can actually be really transformative even for our own hearts and for our community here in Flagstaff. We're gonna share the communion table, as we always do. If you're new or visiting, we believe all are welcome at the completely open table of Christ. And we have two different stations over here, and this is also an artful practice and a spiritual practice that connects us to the divine, to God's love, his unconditional love. And so I wanna encourage you today as you take communion uh, to feel a part of something bigger than yourself. I think that's a really important human ache, personally, to feel like I'm part of something bigger than myself. When we come to the communion table, we're a part of something really, really big, a connection to really diverse people trying to figure out really hard things. But ultimately, there's this, there's this kind of common root to all of it, which is love. And so when I come to the communion table, sometimes I just center on a simple idea like love, and I receive that love into my body. As I take these physical elements into my body, I also experience taking the love of God into my heart. I wanna invite you to have that conversation. And the reason is, what we're talking about in Revelation, you're going to find out, is actually, shockingly, a book about love and about how love will change the world. And we're all part of that. Let me pray over this time, and you can take this uh, either side as, as they sing this song. God, I'm grateful. Um, for a community like this. I'm grateful for these friends. I'm grateful that we can discuss things and disagree and pull on them. And Lord, I'm also grateful now uh, for the book of Revelation. I'm grateful to have had the privilege or the luck uh, or the blessing of being able to learn what ancient minds have understood about this. I'm grateful uh, for, for me, what feels like a redemption story, a book that's felt so hard and confusing and scary, uh, which is actually redeemed into something that's a source of hope and liberation and inclusion and connection. I pray that uh, this community can experience that together. As we come to the communion table today, we center our hearts on love, and we ask you to be with us. You say so clearly in Scripture that you are love. And whoever lives in love lives in you. So, Lord, let us connect in our hearts to your unconditional love for us and also our unconditional love for one another. And be with us in this place. In Jesus' name. safe to say it's been a hard year if I count the ways you kept me here I'd 
write it out and talk about it and you took me in your arms and said though it's not easy to see there's always glimmer you bought the groceries and you let the light in you let the light in It's safe to say it's been a long time I count the ways you kept me clear I'd write it out and cry about it Still took me in your arms and said Though it's not easy to see there's always glimmer you bought the groceries and you let the light in you let the light in you let the light in, the light in. when it's dark you let the light in You let the light in When it's dark going to sing one more song. Feel free to stand if you'd like. Prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true. With thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. Sing that again with us. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. Pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. We belong to the light, we belong to the thunder. We belong to the sound of the words we've both fallen under. Whatever we deny, or embrace, for worse or for better, we belong, we belong, we belong together. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true. Sanctuary for you. Let us become more aware of 
your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. We belong to the light. We belong to the thunder. We belong to the sound of the words we both fall in under. Whatever we deny or embrace, for worse or for better, we belong. We belong. We belong together. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true. Thank you again for coming tonight. As we leave, I do want to remind you, uh, if you are intrigued at all about the finance meeting, it's going to be right over there in that room, which is the cry room. We'll have the lights on and some pizza. It will be a party. I really appreciated how Greta described it as a family meeting. If you feel at all a part of the commons, I would encourage you to come check it out. We want it to be something you opt into, but it is something we want to hear from you and to be able to share transparently to all the, the inner workings that go on in our community. So just want to encourage you and remind you that's kind of our post party pizza thing. If you want to connect with someone else and find a place to go to dinner, that's too, or go watch the, the, uh, the Cowboys 49ers game. And I haven't said anything about the Bills, Eli, for you, but I just did. So let that wash over you. It's been quite a day for some NFL fans out there. So I want to pray. And as we leave today, I want to encourage you uh, to continue the conversation and uh, bring people into it. So hopefully we can really make Revelation alive in the way that it's supposed to be, in a way that's encouraging to all of us. Let me pray. God, thanks so much for a chance to be together. Thank you so much for music and freedom and the space and grace and uh, the book of Revelation, and I just pray that our community will bind closer together and be more inspired through this in Jesus' name. Amen.